We often hear it said that fingers and finger control is absolutely crucial to snare drumming and good technique in general. And I've said it myself in many of my videos, how the fingers need to engage in a certain way to produce the strokes and to create the control that we need. However, it is actually very hard to find reliable and authoritative information into how you actually go about that and what that means in practical terms. So today I'm going to take a quick look at what this means, how we can apply it and how we can practice it to see how making sure that we are properly engaging the fingers fingers is actually going to help with our technique and our performance in general. So what does this mean? I have talked in the past about developing a fulcrum and the way the grip works, but it's worth having a quick recap here because it's very pertinent for the video today. Very quickly, uh, grip comprises three elements, the fulcrum, the fingers, and the wrist. These three elements all work together and synergize to create the strokes we play and to allow us to control the sticks in a certain way. We begin with the fulcrum and I'm repeating myself from other videos here, but some people have the fulcrum between the thumb and the index finger, some people have the, ful the fulcrum between the thumb and the middle finger, and some people, probably like myself, have a mixture of both depending on the context. Sometimes if I'm playing a little bit more loudly, that, finger will, uh, that, that stick will come away from the index finger and be held by the middle finger. If I'm playing with a little bit more control and nuance, I'll be right at the front of the grip using my index finger as the fulcrum. What's far more important is that we actually have a fulcrum at all. I've talked about the role of the fulcrum in the past, so I won't repeat myself here. Suffice it to say, we need to have a strong fulcrum in order for what follows to be possible. The wrist is responsible for essentially sending the stick up and down and injecting momentum into the stroke. These, we know, these are the easy bits. However, I've talked before, and a lot of people say this, about engaging the fingers. So what does that mean? Well. There's a very simple way we can see this in action and a very simple way that we can start to practice this for ourselves. If we hold the stick out in front of us and we hold it at the top simply between our thumb and the first crease of our index finger, I'm not doing anything at this point other than simply holding the stick and you can see it's hanging down in front of me. If I have my palm facing outwards and my arm vertical, the stick is hanging parallel to my forearm and I'm just simply holding the stick between the thumb and the first crease of my index finger. Now from here, I can take these remaining three fingers and lightly place the fingertips on the stick itself. So I'm holding the stick in something resembling a pretty typical matched grip position. From here, without moving my wrist, without moving my thumb, without moving my index finger, I can use these back three fingers to pull the stick into my forearm. And I'm producing this action and I can let that stick just bounce off the forearm and each time I catch it with those three fingers at the top and pull it back again. Now this feels just like bouncing a ball, right? There's no wrist movement at all. The thumb is not doing anything other than holding the stick in position against the first crease of that finger and these three fingers are doing all of the work pulling that stick against my forearm, releasing, engaging. Releasing, engaging, releasing, engaging. So every time I say the fingers need to engage, it is this act of closing and pulling the stick inwards to which I'm referring. Now, of course, if we take this grip and we apply it to the bottom of the stick and we apply this same method on the drum, we get our typical basic bouncing free stroke. Now, just like when I'm performing this up here, and at that sort of speed, there is no need for the wrist to get involved. The wrist can maybe do the initial throw to produce the momentum, but once it's happening, the wrist is not doing anything. The fingers are doing all of the work. Now it's important to say here that the fulcrum has to be firm to allow this ha to happen. The reason it's good to practice it up here is because it, is because it allows us to see the function that the fulcrum is fulfilling. If our, ful if our fulcrum is weak and that stick starts to roll around, we're not going to be able to effectively control that stick. Especially when we take it down to the drum or the pad, you can see that thumb is engaged strongly, firmly, not tense, quite relaxed, but firmly, strong enough to hold it in position, holding the stick against the finger on the opposite side. Without that, the stick has nowhere to pivot, so the fingers can't do their job properly at the back. So every time, as I say, we talk about the fingers engaging in a stroke, it is this act 
of them closing and the stick pivoting on the fulcrum. Now, the most common way to see this in action is when we perform what's called a downstroke. A downstroke is where the stroke begins high, we play an accented stroke, but then we close the hand and it finishes low. This might be in case we want to play an unaccented stroke immediately afterwards, something like this. Oops. Now that's not possible without the use of the fingers. Now as I do the accent, you can see everything is working in unison. The wrists, the arms, the fingers are opening to allow the stick to come back. I throw the stick downwards, the fingers close and produce the snap. Now if I don't do anything else, if I relax the hand after this, we get a rather large rebound like that. You can see the stick goes all the way back up again. However, I don't want this to happen. I want that stick to stay horizontal. So to achieve this, like we've been practicing, those fingers close and keep the stick tight into the back of the hand. And that stick has stayed in a downwards position, ready for the next tap. So this is really one of the fundamental motions with which I think all drummers should be familiar in order to produce things like paradiddles, double strokes, flam taps, and things like that, where unaccented strokes are, requ are required uh, immediately following an accent. This has far bigger ramifications that are beyond the scope of this video. Suffice it to say, the ability to control the rebound using the fingers is absolutely fundamental to it. So we can expand this outwards now into a paradiddle. We know a paradiddle begins with an accent and then has three unaccented strokes, two of which are on the same hand that performed the accent. So if we play a paradiddle and we remove the left hand, we have this, which is very similar to the motion we were just practicing. We have a big accent, the fingers close at the back, keeping the stick down and then we have two taps, and these taps I will come to in a moment. But for now, when we practice the paradiddle or something like it, we need to make sure these fingers are engaging on the accent to produce a downstroke. Absolutely vital for producing the unaccented strokes required for a strong paradiddle. Now, regarding the double strokes themselves, we have a double finger engagement. Now, there are two things at play here, and they are both kind of interrelated, so it's very difficult to separate them. However, it begins with the ability to control the fingers to produce two strokes. So again, you can practice this coming back to this position, thumb and index finger at the top, fingertips down the stick, but this time you can practice playing a heartbeat rhythm. And you can even use your fingers and a bit of strength in the fulcrum to accent the second stroke. And as you're doing this, don't let the stick move out of that fulcrum position. So when we apply this to the drums, we can use a little bit of wrist motion to start us off, but we're trying to use our fingers. Now you can even hear the rhythm created there as the back of the stick is pulled into my hand. You can see I'm playing this from a downwards position. There is only the slightest snap of the wrist. Everything else is coming from that finger engagement. Now once we get to that sort of tempo, something starts to happen. We'll find if I, pursue, if I pursue this in the same vein, it starts to get very tight. As I'm trying to pull that stick into my hand, we start to lose control and I start to tense up. So what starts to happen is the first stroke becomes something of a drop. The fingers open, the fingers relax, and that allows the stick to simply drop down to the drum, producing the first stroke. The fingers then close again immediately afterwards, and this, is cre this creates something we generally call a drop catch. Now to, to play it slowly, you can see I'm having to bring in a little bit more wrist motion. Now this disappears as we get faster, but the general, the general gist of this is there's an opening of the hand and then a closing of the hand. 
and we get that same accented heartbeat effect where the second stroke is accented in virtue of the fingers snapping closed. Now, as we get a little bit faster, everything shrinks and gets smaller. So we come back to something resembling this motion again, but without the tension because that first stroke is just allowed to happen by a releasing and a relaxing of the fingers, allowing the stick to drop. There's a sort of tilting forward of the wrist as the fingers open that produces the first stroke and then a snapping shut of the wrist and the fingers to produce the second. So we can see there with that sort of application how powerful this would be when it comes to our double strokes and paradiddles. The whole purpose here is to engage the fingers in such a way that creates articulation. This is really the whole point of technique in general. We need to be in control of all of those low unaccented strokes. I see many students try to play paradiddles or double strokes um, where they are simply throwing the stick at the drum for the first stroke and hoping to achieve a bounce for the second. <laughs> I find that really difficult to do, but that's the, that's the difficulty they're giving themselves because they are simply hoping for the best. I, honestly, I can't even do it. But you're hoping for the best by trying to allow the sticks to bounce just twice. To me, that feels just more like a bad buzz roll, right? So let's be very, very clear in what we're trying to achieve. When we play double strokes, when we play paradiddles, we are in control of every single stroke. And this comes about from the engagement of the fingers. So working on the finger engagement is a really, really important part of our technical development. So how do we actually go about working on this? Well, we need to find ways to isolate and engage the fingers in a way that enables us to feel what that's like, to become familiar with the motion, and of course, strengthen the fulcrum and the fingers themselves. One way to do this is to apply 30 second note diddle strokes within a 16th note single stroke pattern. What does that mean? So let's take an accent pattern that is three strokes long, one, two, three, one, two, three, played as single strokes. One, two, three, one, two, three. Very simply, each accent we are now going to play as a 30 second note double stroke. I'm going to use my wrist and forearm as a whipping motion to produce the accent, but I'm going to then utilize that drop catch finger engagement to produce the double stroke. Now we can do this without the accent. If we keep everything relatively low, we can get really quite fast with this using just the fingers. However, that's missing the point because by applying the accent, by really whipping the first stroke, it forces our fulcrum to be strong enough not to drop the stick. Because of the amount of energy now coming through those sticks, being thrown at the drum by the accent, I'm really having to work hard in my grip. My fulcrum is really having to be strong and firm, and my fingers are having to be really quite precise so as not to drop the stick and to try to keep those strokes articulated. Once that motion starts to become familiar, you can apply it in different permutations. We might try a grouping of five where we have two accents on one hand, one, two, three, four, five, and then two accents on the other, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> We can hear those double strokes, those diddles starting to formulate, but crucially, I'm in control of both of them. This is starting to talk about that finger engagement or use that finger engagement that we're talking about. 
Now we can expand this further. This is something I discussed in the uh, previous videos about developing the weak hand and developing a strong fulcrum. But again, they're applicable here for developing the fingers. We can use um, numbers of strokes uh, on the on one hand to make sure our fingers are working properly. So let's take a grouping of three. I'm going to do two unaccented strokes followed by an accent on the same hand. And that's using a kind of drop catch or a drop clinch followed by a snapping shut for an accent. You see that drop catch at the beginning. And there's a sort of um, staggered opening, open, open, snap. To produce those three strokes. If we add a stroke, this becomes even more pronounced. I can't do that without the fingers engaging. The wrist applies the initial energy, the initial momentum, the fulcrum stays strong and still, and the fingers are engaging the required number of times to produce the required number of strokes. So we can do something much longer now. I don't know how many this will be. 12 or something like that, it doesn't really matter. The whole point is I'm maintaining the bounce using just my fingers and then whipping it closed for the accent. I can't do any of that if that finger, if those fingers are not engaging properly. But for the fingers to engage properly, the fulcrum has to be strong. For the, for the amount of energy to get into the stroke, the wrist has to get involved. So this is what I meant at the beginning when I talked about all three of these elements working together. Now, there are plenty of ways to practice this. The Snedrum Virtuoso is full of technical studies that utilize this and require this sort of technical uh, approach, but much of the repertoire does as well. So uh, Pratt is good for this because of his rudimental work. It requires a very strong use of the fingers. And somebody like Rick Dior has a wonderful set of videos on this as well. And he is a wonderful drummer to check out. But nevertheless, to achieve a certain degree of control and prowess on the snare drum or on the drum kit generally, we have to develop that finger control. This begins with the fulcrum and it begins with understanding what it means for those fingers to actually engage. So one, as a closing thought, one way that you might get started with this is to adopt this position with both hands. Your palms are facing outwards. Your sticks are held relatively firmly between the thumb and the first crease of the index finger. I'm, I'm obstructed by the microphone. Uh, the hands are facing upwards, so the sticks are just hanging downwards. And the fingertips pull the sticks into your wrist. And from this position, using just your fingers, you can start to practice various rudiments of your choice, trying to make the fingers do all the work. So you can see here, the wrist is not moving. This is not using an up and down motion to produce the stroke. This is using just the fingers. So paradiddles, double strokes, roughs, flams, it doesn't really matter. You can run through them all. And the idea is not to become really good at playing the drums on your elbows. It's to become confident in understanding what it means for those fingers to engage. And once you start to feel it, if it's not something you're familiar with, you will wonder how you ever got by without it. Because the act of those fingers engaging is absolutely crucial for controlling the sticks and producing the sorts of strokes we want to produce. So I hope this has been of use to some of you. As I say, the Snare Drum Virtuoso is absolutely full of technical concept and studies for this sort of thing. And I offer uh, private tuition on this as well. So please visit my website if you'd like to discuss that further. I hope this has been of some use to some of you. Good luck in your own practice. Thank you very much. See you on the next one.